Good evening. I'm Taya Ryan, President and CEO of Georgia Public Broadcasting. As a public media outlet, GPB offers trusted, in-depth coverage of the issues that impact our lives. This year, as the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about national public health and economic crisis, GPB and NPR reporters have been at the forefront of the story. Tonight, we bring you the first installment of our new NPR virtual speaker series, featuring GPB's Ricky Bevington in conversation with NPR's Yuki Noguchi and Netta Ulibi. This series provides a unique opportunity for listeners to hear directly from the journalists covering these stories. Tonight, we'll discuss the creative industry's path to recovery in the wake of a global pandemic. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for supporting GPB. Thank you so much, Taya, and thanks to our audience, all of you for being here. I'm Ricky Bevington, host of All Things Considered on GPB, and I'm so pleased to be joined tonight by NPR's Yuki Noguchi and Neta Ulibi. And I am so pleased to join all of you and invite you to share your questions using the Q&A function here in our Zoom. You can tee them up. We will do our best to get to as many of them as we can. Neta and Yuki and I are, are gonna have a brief conversation and then we will open it up to audience questions. I'll do some brief bios so uh, we can uh, get to know our panelists a little bit better. Yuki Noguchi served as a correspondent on NPR's business desk for a number of years before just recently transitioning to the science desk. She has covered a range of business and economic news with a special focus on the workplace, anything that affects how and why we work. And I can only imagine how the pandemic has kept Yuki very busy in terms of covering how and why we work. Netta Ulibi reports on arts and entertainment and cultural trends for NPR's Arts Desk. Netta's radio and online stories reflect political and economic realities, cultural issues, obsessions and transitions, and artistic awesomeness. She has profiled breakout artists and well-known performers such as Tyler Perry, Ryan Seacrest, Mark Ruffalo, Courtney Love, Netta has done extensive reporting over the past months on the ways that the fine and performing arts industries are coping during the pandemic. And I'm so excited that we have two real specialists who've dedicated the last, well, the last uh, couple of years of their career, certainly to journalism, but the last couple of months to covering how the pandemic is impacting all of our lives. And so I would like to begin by asking both of you, you know, just paint a picture for us, illustrate what this pandemic has set what your work setup has been, and then also what stories you've been focusing on. Um, and also, you know, I imagine you have teams on your science and arts, arts desk. Maybe you can share a little bit of, and maybe behind the scenes of what it's like to work on those desks for NPR as well. So Yuki, I'll invite you to go first and then we'll go to Netta. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for that, Ricky, and um, for having me. It's really great. Uh, I wish I could sort of see you all in person. Um, uh, so yes, I'm, I'm Yuki Noguchi. I'm based in the DC area and uh, I've been working for NPR for uh, something like 12 years now. And um, I had been a business reporter for like two decades. Uh, and then at sort of the start of the pandemic started covering mental health uh, for science desk. So, um, and in terms of personally, I mean, you know, it's funny, I, I sort of documented um, our descent into lockdown, if you will, um, by interviewing my own son about the fact that he was going to be staying at home and doing uh, Zoom classes and that whole, pro you know, that learning process that we all went through. Um, and uh, I ended up, you know, kind of living in uh, another house in Chevy Chase, my, you know, what we thought was gonna be a two week stay there turned out to be uh, well, seven months for my son on an air mattress, poor soul. Um, but uh, so then, uh, and just re just last week, actually, we moved. Uh, I bought a house and moved. So I've been in upheaval, but um, uh, but it's been it's been it's felt very important to cover mental health um, at this time and and sort of how it's interesting how that's we woven its way into everything. Um, you know, you mentioned I covered 
economics and stuff like that before consumer stuff, uh, how we work, all that stuff. I mean, it's it's very front and center. So it's it's felt very uh, purposeful the last few months and also very hectic. And like everybody else, I'm like constantly running off of my calls to go try to fix the internet, including today. So anyway, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> And uh, I'm Nadu Ulibi. I cover arts and culture. Um, you know, the pandemic has has upended us in, in so many strange and curious ways. And one way that it's it's changed my life is I'm actually very close or relatively close to you guys in Atlanta right now, presuming you are in Atlanta and not, you know, in Washington, D.C., which is also where I normally live, although I used to do a lot of reporting from, from or I used to do a lot of reporting from the coasts. Um, I'm actually working in Western North Carolina this, uh, right now. I woke up to a hurricane or the tail end of a tropical depression. I'm very grateful to have power. And uh, I am here just because I took the opportunity to um, to stay at a friend's house. It's been wonderful to be in a different part of the country. It's great to be in a swing state. Actually, um, part of my idea is that I'm, I, I've, have, I've helped cover elections in the past and it's good to be here and just be another body on, on the ground um, in a state that's, that's very politically interesting uh, right now. And um, not as if there's not enough going on in the world of the arts, which is, which is a lot. Um, one of the challenges that we're having on the arts desk right now, and I'm, I'm just going to be kind of very, very blunt, is uh, we, you know, we're, we're arts journalists and we're concerned about the future of multiple industries within the arts. And, um, and one of the things that we're having to do is, as journalists, as the, for, with the arts desk at NPR is toggle between covering the cultural effects of Black Lives Matter and the pandemic and the, you know, whatever the most recent presidential, you know, edict has been and um, constant requests from the show saying, the news is also dire, please give us something fun. <laughs> and we're like, but all the ballet companies that aren't going to get to do a nutcracker this year and are going to go out of business as a result of that, you know, like we're, we're, we're very concerned about, about, uh, about the collapsing industries and, in, that you know that we're covering, and we don't see ourselves as as providing distraction <laughs> necessarily from the the real news. Um, and at the same time, we, we understand that that arts are a place where people find solace and joy and relief. And um, it's been it's been a real challenge to be navigating that right now. That's absolutely fascinating to think about the you know arts in in and of themselves can be thought of as escape. But arts journalism is is journalism, <laughs> and uh, and we need to know about the nutcrackers that aren't happening um, this season and all of the seasonal productions that won't be happening. So before we switch to a conversation about the creative industries and also um, what it's been like for both of you to be reporting during a pandemic, which I think our audience would be very curious to hear about with what it's like to simply be a journalist out in the field in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I just wanna share with our audience some big broad numbers about how important the arts are in our state. If you're, if you're on the Zoom, you probably have a stake in this, but in, in case you don't know, the billions of dollars of economic impact, the creative industries in Georgia represent a combined $37 billion in revenue, including 200,000 employed people with a, with $12 billion in earnings. And this is a total economic impact of about $62, $63 billion. The creative industries represent 5% of all employment and 4% of all business revenue in the state. So this is significant. And certainly a pandemic impacts every single sector of the economy, but uh, arts and entertainment and tourism are taking a huge hit right now because these are things we want to do in person. So Netta, let, let's start with Georgia's most high profile artistic industry, which of, of course is Hollywood, film and television productions. I went on the Georgia Department of Economic website, development website, and just to see what's, what's even being filmed right now in Georgia, there are 27 productions that are actually being filmed right now, whether it's Netflix, HBO, Amazon Universal, obviously a smaller list than a typical day in Georgia, but what trends are you seeing right now in movies and television? Well, I gotta say that Georgia has Hollywood beat right now. <laughs> According to the LA Film Office, there are 17 productions 
in process right now, just being filmed right now in Los Angeles County. That's the number of active permits there are at, at the moment. And um, so you guys have them beat, right? And the numbers are a little bit telling. Right now in Los Angeles, there are um, five feature films, five dramas that are being filmed and seven reality shows. So when you talk about trends, you know, reality is is a lot cheaper to film. It's easier to film. It's you can uh, you can it, it can be in a contained space. Compliance with COVID restrictions is adding as much as twenty percent to shows budgets. So people, as many of you guys probably know, are turning to all kinds of creative solutions. Puppets, <laughs> um, uh, you know, animation is something. One of the things that I'm really interested in, and uh, this is this is more of a content thing than a than a logistics thing, is how people are beginning to explore telling stories about the, the moment that we're in right now. I was in a, in a literary discussion panel not too long ago with no one less than Stephen King. Um, people were talking about literature and the pandemic and the question came up there, how, um, how, how are people, how is the pandemic going to be a part of storytelling moving forward? And Stephen King was like, anything that is set in 2020 or 2021 or 2022 or 2023, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing by the way, this isn't like a direct quote, is going to be about the pandemic. You know, this is just going to affect our lives um, in in so many ways. You can't not write about the pandemic in any way that's that would make sense in anything that's set after February 2020. Um, and you know, I, I I think that we probably all share as viewers, first of all, an aversion to new content. <laughs> Evidently, as as we all know, re rewatching has has really been a dominant theme. Um, but there have been some. It's been very fitful. The uh, the ability to tell stories that are that are truly addressing this moment. You know, you have shows like that were made before the pandemic that seem to speak to to um, to the moment that we're in right now more than some stuff that's sort of hastily being hobbled together that said you know um you know this is us had a, a really successful uh a show that was filmed since the pandemic um the guy who did uh, triumph the insult dog robert smeagol he did a, an all puppet response to the pandemic that people liked and one of the things that i think is really kind of um wonderful right now and unexpected is the sort of old broadcast news shows i know this isn't scripted or even like entertainment per se but you know like meet the press and you know world news tonight those shows are doing really really well like much better than i think than they were before the pandemic and i think it's partly because we're getting so much crazy information from all over the place that there's something so reassuring about the good old standard anchor telling you what's going on responding packaging the news in digestible ways and from and from a you know as insofar as we could talk about a trusted news source this way, you know, in, in this era that, you know, they are. And by the way, if you hear groans, it's, um, it's my greyhound who's lying on the bed right next to me. <laughs> Part of the uh, workplace dynamic of. Yeah, um, that's right. My, my producer is yeah. kind of noisy. Yeah. As much as I'd love to be on a stage with both of you in Atlanta, we'll have to be <laughs> in check. And I know our audience would love to be meeting you in person. So uh, we promise to invite you back mm -hmm. sometime in the future when it's safe. Um, you talked about how creative people, Netta, are telling this story as we live it. Very appropriate that Stephen King, a horror author, would be brought up because for a lot of us, there's a lot of horror happening, but also some really fun creativity happening. So what are you seeing for people who can't get out of the house to do productions? How are they getting creative? Yeah, this is a... a um... It's kind of funny. There's this old, there's this old joke, you, you know, you guys may have heard it, that if you're looking for really cutting edge uh, ways to use technology or really innovative ways to handle limitations, the place to look is porn. Uh, <laughs> we don't cover porn at NPR. Uh, I, I'm not on top of, so to speak, what's happening in that world. But another place you can look at that does, that, that finds interesting workarounds is genre film, particularly horror movies. And this feels very Halloween at this moment right now, but I, I did a piece not too long ago about how people are making, just like ordinary people are making horror movies during lockdown. This is, you know, sort of before things opened up a little bit, like families and, and groups of friends who were trapped together were making their own homemade horror movies. And uh, and of course, you know what better catharsis than than a horror movie at this moment? But one of the unexpected things that, that I found as a as a result of this was that actual real directors were like, yes, this is kind of a moment where we can explore these these themes. And and there's something about being locked in 
and it's scary and there's tension and there's this there's this implacable invisible force out there it's it it's it was all lending itself to um to 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 making horror movies and this british filmmaker i i, I in this piece I, I coined a term that people hated which was core horror maybe because it's like saying the rural juror or something like that core horror is it's kind of a bad thing to actually say but um but this british filmmaker made a movie a horror movie entirely on zoom he got together a group of actors that he was very used to working with and i'm, I'm going to play a little piece of tape for you and one of the genius things about this movie which is called host and it's on a startup platform called well it's not really startup but it's on it's on shutter which is um which is uh, uh on anc amc um and uh and so he of course he had the actors you know do their own makeup and their own lighting and he had them do their own location scouting and so i'm going to play you a little piece of tape in which he talks about having the actors do that and um and also just how he used zoom to maximize um, the possibilities of, of horror. So this is clip three, if you don't mind um, hitting clip three. The first thing we did is we got them all to film little video tours of their house and to start suggesting what are the places in your house that you feel most creeped out in? Where would you least like to be after dark? But the creepiest place, honestly, is just on Zoom. There were plenty of scares to be milked in the garbled audio and inexplicable dropouts. <laughs> or those artificial backgrounds that just seem so uncanny, and those strange special effects that put horns or animal noses on people's faces. Whoa. Whoa. Hey, Emma! Emma, turn the filters off. Come on. You know, really, we just had this great opportunity to freak people out doing something that's now a part of their daily routine. So I just want to add really quickly that that director whose name is Rob Savage uh, did so well with this movie which I think he filmed he wrote filmed and produced it in 12 weeks it was based on a prank he played on some some friends and, and I should have mentioned this earlier that the setup of the movie is that it's friends having a seance over zoom and of course everything goes terribly about as well as you can expect um but he has ended up getting a three picture deal from this movie um with Blumhouse which is the company that did um get out and um and uh that's a, a company that you know, prints money with low budget horror. So this is one happy pandemic story about a uh, an inventive director who has found success by working within constraints. We have a wonderful comment on that topic uh, from Laura Smith, who's with uh, Atlanta's own Dad's Garage Theater, which is an improv <laughs> company. And Dad's Garage has actually moved to Twitch pretty immediately during the pandemic and got very creative in terms of attracting a younger online audience. But Laura says it's been so interesting to see how movies and television immediately seem dated when you see large unmasked crowds Oh my God. It's really been my experience too, watching shows like, oh, those people are hugging. That's so weird. I kind of get a little shiver. Um, and uh, we have a question from our CEO, Taya Ryan, who says, Yuki, did I hear that you were moving to business? If I have that right, why the change? If you'd like to answer that question. You know, this is more of like, I, I mean, I, I was very interested in uh, mental health issues, uh, especially with the pandemic happening and you know it just so happened that someone was on maternity leave and on the science desk uh i think i'm going to end up staying there i it, it, now i've been i've sort of um incorporated uh sort of racial inequity in, in healthcare to my beat as well so i'm trying to do a lot um you know i'm trying to dip my hand you know a little bit to fill um you know a vacancy for my old job and then um kind of doing some new stuff that the that the network wants i mean i really relate to these comments about the immediate obsolescence of of things the, the sense that like we're living in these times that um you know it feels like a, a generation passes in two weeks or something um and you know it's interesting to think how that's accelerating production because i i i acutely remember that especially at the beginning of pandemic um you know, you would report something and and you would, I don't know about you, Netta, but it was like I had to clamor to get on air so that mm -hmm. it wouldn't sound dated in two days. You know, um, so many things were happening. It was like drinking from a fire hose every day. Well, you know, production, in my experience at GPB Radio, we've all had to get extremely creative with how we make radio and, and 
to, to bring our audience into our thinking, we, the three of us, are creatives as well. Um, journalism, you know, it checks a lot of boxes, but at the end of the day, we are people who sew together audio and words to tell stories every day. So Yuki, let me ask you, you know, we, we, we talk in public radio about really capturing a lot of sounds to help the audience be there at the scene, so to speak. We'll, we'll record the refrigerator and the bus driving by and the dog barking. And we, we put all these sounds together to create an, a radio scene to help our audience be there, whatever it is we're reporting on. How have you been able to do this without being able to leave your house? I mean, it, you know, it's, you know, it, it's really, I, I, I've never experienced, like, I've, I've, obviously everybody else, like anything like it. And it's, it's, you know, we, when we talk about public radio, we talk about its creative energy being in that ability to create scene and to really replicate feelings and really get people to empathize with what people are talking about through sound and you know the i, I mean i went to minnesota a, a couple of weeks ago um to do some my first in-person reporting and it was like a breath of fresh air i just i don't know how i had been doing it before but um but you know i i i did have a story um and i can't remember the exact timing of this piece but um you know, one of the things it was, it was at a time when I was sort of segueing into sort of coverage about, um, you know, um, delays in cancer treatment and uh, sort of the impact that was having, uh, I think this was in like June timeframe. And um, I talked to this woman, Alexia Gaffney, she was like a this like really impressive doctor, really great personality. And I found myself like, wanting to like hug her and you know sort of um I felt like she was my friend and I didn't you know meanwhile I sat down and I thought well I don't even know how to describe her house in this story you know and uh, or what life is like for her she's like a stage three cancer fighter and um single mom and you know I'm a single mom so I put a related hat and I was like you know, I, I just wanted to capture her life and I couldn't do it uh, in the same way. So I actually ended up calling her back and just being like, you know, what it like, where is that gazebo that you told me about in, is it your front yard or your backyard? And so like, you know, I, I sort of, I had to ask, go back to ask, it was almost like newspaper life. You know, I was a newspaper and before and um, I was at the Washington Post for 10 years before I came to NPR. And, you know, it was the same thing, you know, you're, you're trying to do this thing. And now it's almost like we're back to pen and paper again. So anyway, I have this, I have this clip from uh, her where I, you know, I, I wanted to bring her to life. And so I had to kind of catch the margins of tape from my interview with her and just like pull that in because it was more personal and made her feel more like she was there. And I believe this is the Alexia, Alexa Gaffney one audio clip. Yeah. She's making breakfast. I reach Alexia Gaffney early one morning in the kitchen of her split level ranch home. She lives on a tree lined street in Stony Brook, New York, not far from family and perilously close to the early epicenter of the virus. She looks onto a backyard with a wooden swing, gazebo and an above ground pool once the hub for social gatherings hosted by Gaffney and her eight-year-old daughter, Kennedy. And you probably hear my eggs frying in the background, which I'm just about done with. <laughs> Gaffney is fortifying herself for battles fought on many fronts. She's an infectious disease doctor treating patients with COVID. She's also a single mom, homeschooling Kennedy. And two years ago, at age 37, she was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. So life is a minefield of risks, one she mitigates with face masks, protective gear, and lots of hand washing. It doesn't stop me from getting nervous every single day about, is this the day that it gets me? And, you know, I anticipate living with this kind of fear for a very long time to come. It's so powerful, Yuki, to, have, to hear from her. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, that's the, that's the sort of challenge is there's so much going on, but, you know, we kind of have to, like, stop and breathe and make people care. And one of the things that I have found personally challenging is sometimes it feels like I'm just harping on problems, you know, like, because whether it's the economy or mental health, or, you know, social issue, unrest. I mean, there's not a lot of, as Netta points out, joy, you know, moments of uplift to talk about organically, but these people are really great. And so I think it's, it sort of refocused me on what makes NPR stories so great, which is always the people, right? So you just have to kind of evoke these characters by getting them to be themselves more on, on the phone. And, um, you know, it's like that story with Alexia, they sort of goes on and she talks about this other emotional thing. And, and, you know, again, maybe we could sort of play that tape. This is Alexa Gaffney, the second cut, if we have it available to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Her nephew, like Gaffney, is Black. Her voice swells with pride for him. And he did all of that with all the stress and turmoil of everything that's happening in the world around him. COVID and racial inequality and, and protests and people And the painful specter of police brutality. He defied the odds, you know, and it's like, we're going to celebrate that. It's too important not to celebrate. But first, her family weighed the many risks. That most of Gaffney's family live in high rises in New York City that her mother and pregnant sister work for the Metropolitan Transit Authority that runs the city's subways and buses. There's no social distancing when you work for the MTA. You're going to work every day. They settled on a backyard barbecue, taking every precaution. One set of food for every table. If your table ran out of food, that was it. And separate drinks for every table. Like, it was a big to-do. Yet when life hangs in the balance, no measure seems sufficient wipe down the faucets and the doorknob when you come out of the bathroom. Like, it was such a big to-do. And when it was done, I was just freaking the hell out the whole time. Oh, my God. Did we stay far enough? Did everybody wear their mask? Okay, some people took their mask down. You know, was there enough hand sanitizer? Like, it feels like insanity. I mean, who can't relate to that? <laughs> Completely. So, um... Yeah, so I mean, it's been a, yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, I think, you know, I can, I can talk about the contrast to when I was traveling to Minneapolis and, you know, I, I like normally I might be able to walk up to somebody on the street and, and ask them, you know, questions. I, I wasn't able to do that, you know, so it's like, you're still, even when you're in person, you're kind of like, hamstrung you can't go into buildings you know um our security safety people were like you can't you know if you go into a building it's gonna be for like seconds and you're gonna like put your n95 on and you know i, I get it it's it's sort of it's odd to be in you know reporting on a story that's so intimate that like people feel so viscerally and for so many different reasons and not have access to people you know that kind of like overcoming that intimacy is something that or like that intimacy barrier um is something that you know took just a lot of planning you know down to i will meet you here you know planning those scenes out in a way um which i know is probably common in movies but in radio we kind of tend, tend to sort of like let things happen organically right. and in this case you know you i had to like you know, plan, okay, what's going to be there? Who's going to be there? Where are we going to be talking? Did it, like all kind of visualize it ahead of time and sort of um, make sure that on top of all that, that we're sort of staying safe and keeping our, our interviewees safe. Um, sure, I think, I think but, so people really want to talk. And so, yeah, you know, you, you yeah. end up, you end up like wanting to get close to them, like physically close to them. So it was like, Holding a fishbowl <laughs> microphone, first of all, is yeah. so heavy. It is so heavy. Right. Uh, you know, even with a producer that you know was standing, like she, like she couldn't hold that thing up. You know, <laughs> so it's. I, I imagine that people, you know, who are in the creative industries, who are, you know, doing these kinds of things, it's the. I, I would be so fascinated to know how you're overcoming some of those challenges. Yeah, we were talking about that for election night because we'll all be out. The entire GPD News team, you know, we we have to talk to voters 
Um, so we've been going over safety protocol and making sure that we're comfortable and the person we're talking to is comfortable um, because it's not a very good interview if somebody's mad at you for violating their social <laughs> distance, right? I just want to read a comment. We have some great questions coming in. I will get to these. So I just want to read a comment from Bert Wesley Huffman who says, in a time when so much media is coming from a particular point of view, NPR continues to set the standard for quality non-biased journalism. Talk about your passion for a focus on the truth in public radio journalism. And um, I'll ask both of you to, to just share your answer to this question. And then I wanna talk about museums and philanthropy with Netta before we get some more questions. So I'll invite both of you to just talk about um, working for non-commercial journalism at this time before we move on to museums and some of the other questions. Netta, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think I, I will say that NPR is a lot more commercial than it used to be just in terms of where it gets its money. And I think part of telling the truth is, is being, is acknowledging that, um, you know, we are not, fun we don't take, we get barely any government funding and, um, and we actually do rely a lot on, on ads. Um, yeah, and no, uh, I'll just say that, you know, one thing I've noticed because we've had a lot of stories about Facebook around the election and every single time NPR talks about Facebook, NPR tells the audience that's that right. Facebook is a financial supporter. That's the kind of transparency that people yeah. expect from public radio that really distinguishes us from so many others. But continue. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, the the only other thing that, that I want to add is, like Yuki, I, I come from an immigrant family or a half immigrant family, and my father moved from the Middle East to Lawrence, Kansas, and we lived in a when I was a little kid, we lived in a community that clung to its public radio. It really needed public radio, particularly at a moment when, you know, it was you know it was before the internet. It was before you know you could get um, a lot of uh, you know, national newspapers um, when you were in, in what then seemed like very far flung places. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a public radio kid. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to work at a place where not everybody is. Um, there are a lot of people like one of my closest producers had never heard of NPR um, until until he, he ended up getting a job there. And I think it's really important to have a, a huge diversity of, in, in all different kinds of backgrounds of people who work there. But I grew up um, treasuring what public radio brought to um, to the air and to the people who listen to it. And I, I, it's, it's to be able to have some small part in upholding this kind of legacy is such an honor and such a responsibility. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, um, I grew up in a Japanese speaking household. And so, you know, public radio, I think did a lot to teach me you know, how to speak, you know, how to write and, um, and also how to pay attention to the world. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I have a huge set of gratitude uh, to, to NPR. And, you know, in terms of like commitment to truth, I mean, I think, I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty frustrating to be a journalist and um, to, to cover things like science uh, right now, because uh, it's, it's so important. And it's, it's, um, it's a very new dynamic to be defending, um, stories, uh, just based on like to have arguments about numbers and about facts. Um, and, you know, and I think there's a lot of, you know, candidly, I think there's a lot of effort that the science desk has put into, um, trying to, uh, you know, refute, um, incorrect things that are said, uh, you know, it, it's, it creates a lot of work, I can say, uh, um, in terms of having to, you know, assert and reassert um, sort of the science behind some of the things that we're talking about. Um, that's a new dynamic for me. Um, uh, I don't think that that, I can't recall a time when that was the case. I mean, you know, um, but I, I have to say, I mean, I think that I do feel a huge sense of purpose too. I mean, I think in the, amidst the pandemic, I do, do feel, you know, a, a deep obligation um, and a sense of purpose and urgency around all of those things. So it's, 
it's it's half of one thing and a half, you know, six of another. I mean, it's really, it's been, um, it's definitely just been interesting. And also just, it's, 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 it's a, it's a service that I, I hope that people are still listening and still, you know, paying attention because it can be so confusing. And I know that we're spending a lot of res of our own internal resources trying to, you know, defend um, facts. Science of it. Absolutely. So um, a major player, certainly in Metro Atlanta, is the Woodruff Arts Center. I'm just going to go back to our arts and culture a little bit. Um, before we get to a question from a student here at Clark Atlanta University, Jamila, we'll get to your student, your question after we talk a little bit about the role of art museums. When we think about arts in America, museums are one of the first things that come to mind. And the High Museum of Art is uh, really a gem of the Southeast, as we say. Um, the entire Woodruff Art Center campuses, of course, but the High Museum has done their best to keep everybody safe during the pandemic after shutting down for a couple of weeks at the beginning has reopened. Netta, what are you seeing with museums nationally in terms of how they're faring right now? Yeah, I've, I've been um, spending a lot more time since the pandemic on museums. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting space right now. You know, museums are repositories of culture. Um, all of the fractures that existed in the culture are just getting bigger as a result of the pandemic and the economic crisis. And I think museums have really been on the forefront of a lot of the, that, a lot of painful discussions, a lot of painful decisions, and a lot of painful problems. The American Alliance of Museums has predicted that 30% of all museums are going to close as a result of the economic consequences of the pandemic. And certainly a museum like the Hyde Museum is, is most likely going to be fine. Um, and, and I haven't been following um, a lot of what's been happening in Georgia with museums, but you know, museums across the country are engaged in very difficult discussions about um, whether or not to sell works of art, um, the, the accessioning rules, which is, you know, selling art is those rules have been relaxed. Do you sell a work of art to an old work of art to buy a new work of art by a new up and coming artist who may be underrepresented in your collection? Do you use money to hire more curators of color since there are so very, very, very few curators of color? And how do you reach, you know, museums are kind of stodgy, often stodgy old places. How do you reach new exciting audiences to speak to everybody? Um, and in the meantime, the museums that are very, very much in danger are the smaller museums. In Georgia, the Georgia Museum of Radio has closed, uh, which that's, a that's <laughs> I think, a, a museum that's probably dear to the heart of everybody here, not that I've ever even been there, but it's a radio museum. And small museums, of course, tend to be in, you know, uh, they're often like, you know, historical societies or so forth. They're in ex properties that are expensive to maintain. They, they depend on events for their income. They're not going to be any events. Those are the kinds of museums that um, I think people are really, really worried that we're going to lose. Um, and one kind of museum that has been facing a lot of trouble have been children's museums. And uh, of course, because there's a lot of, you know, what is a children's museum, but please touch is, is fundamental to children's museums. And uh, I did a, a piece uh, after noticing that many children's museums had closed. They've closed in Champaign, Urbana, they've closed in, um, in Oakhurst, California. There's one in danger of closing in um, the Children's Museum of Low Country in South Carolina. So if, if you don't mind playing clip one, you're, you can hear a little bit of a piece that I did about a, a, a about the what the kind of problems facing children's museums right now. So it's clip one. The biggest, most famous children's museums are fine for now, but most are neither big nor famous. Since March, children's museums have been lost in Oakhurst, California, Champaign, Illinois, and Fredericksburg, Virginia. It's heartbreaking. I signed the final paperwork last week and our final walkthrough is actually at 2.30 this afternoon. Danielle Ripperton runs the Children's Museum of Richmond in Virginia. It has, or had, four branches, including the Fredericksburg location her board decided to close on June 1st. The museum laid off 42 employees at the start of the pandemic, and Fredericksburg cost more than $300,000 a year to run. And if we had kept all the locations, that would mean that probably the organization was not going to survive. <laughs> So yeah, it's that's a that's one of my non-joy art stories that I've contributed to the network recently. 
Yeah, we have a comment um, again from Laura Smith, and then I'm going to get to this question from Jamila. Laura says, and interestingly, a lot of museums have been able to open with social distancing. Performing arts haven't been able to do that to the same degree. And I will say I was speaking to a local musician here at video TV, a film producer as well here in Atlanta, Kabir Sagal, and he was saying he's a musician and he's been trying to, I guess at the beginning of the pandemic, music musicians were trying to work together online and because of delays on on internet you can't really jam with other musicians over zoom you can't really sing uh because there's delays and i thought gosh i mean i guess in a way museums uh, may, i don't want to say have it better everybody has it terribly but um you can maintain social distancing, except with children, as you pointed out, Netta. Children are high touch. They wanna to be with each other and they wanna to touch everything, certainly. Um, we have a question from- Can uh, I just make a comment? Yes. Uh, that's just like, it's just like a, 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 a random observation about the music thing. You know, it's funny though, people really do want joy right now. And I was walking in my neighborhood as I want to do these days and, um, you know, someone's family band was playing on their front lawn. And I thought, well, they would never have a venue. But now in this case, you know, they had parked their, their, you know, they had set up shop in front of their house. And then all these people were walking along the path, brought in their lawn chairs and were socially distanced around them. And it was just very cute. So I wonder how much of that is going on as well. No, I think, in fact, our, our Macon reporter, Grant Blankenship, did a story about a church choir that were, they would, they would be on different, um, they would stand around and just sing because they needed the, they needed the spiritual uplift. They needed to be together, but six feet apart. And I know singing is dangerous in a, in a pandemic with a virus, but they were outdoors and they really, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful story, especially for radio because it was audio based and the photos. You know, in the, yeah, I mean, and in the early in the pandemic in Italy, you know, people were singing, neighbors were singing opera to one another. And I thought, well, that's telling of a culture. <laughs> so here's our question from Jamila Wood, a student at Clark Atlanta University. Jamila writes, I appreciate this opportunity to be hearing from wonderful journalists. It is very refreshing to see women sharing their experience in journalism. All right. And Jamila asks, once the pandemic is over, what new qualities will be important to a journalist looking to work at NPR or any other publication? Okay, well, I mean, I um, I would say that probably the pandemic has accelerated the workforce's shift towards being a contractor, you know, and one thing that's striking to me about being a contractor is, um, you know, and I think the pandemic has sort of created this mentality, even in, in you know, NPR employees like ourselves, I mean, is you're kind of a one man show, you kind of don't, you can't, you can't uh, rely on a team, you know, you kind of have to go with your own instincts and, and do your own, um, I mean, uh, largely I have just been sort of coming up with my own ideas and, and you know, taking my own photos and thinking about solving, uh, you know, my own problems and recording in my um, closet, uh, you know, and, and doing things like this and sort of solving your own problems. I think, uh, you know, thinking, versatility uh, has, I have noticed a difference in at NPR about that. I mean, they just, you know, whatever we, however we did things the way before, you know, has kind of, oh, there's nothing for the way we're going to do it now or in the future. And, you know, I think that um, whereas before we used to sort of try to get stories on air and then our web versions of that story on the same time, we no longer care about that. It's just, it's just about getting the information out however it needs to get out as quickly as it can get out and whether it's web only or radio only and just sort of being adaptable like that and sort of a self-started and, and sort of figuring out, uh, you know, where is the problem that I can solve that I can just go ahead and start solving without, you know, kind of having an institution and tell me, give me direction on this. I mean, that kind of thing, I think, is probably true of a lot of workforces. It just rem it reminds me of contractors who, you know, have to handle their own payroll and manage their own time and do all this stuff. I mean, you know, we're all doing that right now, I think. I hope that answers the question. 
I, I would just add that um, now is a really exciting time for young arts and culture reporters. Um, the arts and cultures can be a very brutal place to be a journalist simply because of budget reasons, you know, and, and I understand that. I, I think that there should be more money into being placed into international coverage, into health and science, particularly during a, a pandemic, it, during it to Washington national coverage. All of this is, is live or die kind of stuff. Um, I do personally think that the arts are, are live and die, but um, I, I also understand why they aren't always a priority and they don't always have the budget. That said, um, right now there are not a lot of um, people who can talk a, about the, the monumental changes that are happening uh, in the way in the ways people are consuming culture. I mean, I come from old media. I come from a, from legacy media. I come from people watching movies and movie theaters and people turning on the radio and flipping channels and video games are, are something that I, I don't really know that much about. If you are a young up and coming journalist who can write about the video game industry and can make it sing and can translate, uh, if you can translate TikTok, if you can translate all kinds of different kinds of online self-expression, um, there's there's a, a place for you in the world of journalism right now. Um, and uh, and I, I would encourage young journalists to go into these spaces and report on these spaces that older journalists simply don't have the facility or the bandwidth to be able to do. I love how you put that, Nada. You, you know, the beat would be the online self-expression beat. <laughs> no longer the arts and culture beat, it's the online self-expression beat. Um, we have some wonderful comments in the chat and everybody's welcome to engage in the chat with each other as though we're all in the same room together talking. Um, Josh Phillipson points out that uh, his neighbor's hood, he says, we have at least three bands performing regularly on front lawns in our neighborhood. So as uh, Yuki was saying, that people are just making music together outside. Um, and Elizabeth Hale points out, it's wonderful to see how George Washington's Mount Vernon has pivoted and offered a huge array of virtual offerings, making our educational and historical offerings available nationwide. And I know the Atlanta History Center has put all, almost everything online for people to learn. You know, maybe people are learning more about history online um, if they can't. I, I, get to I, for, forgive me, I'm just going to throw a giant wet blanket on all of this stuff. It is great that all of this stuff is happening, but no one is paying those musicians. Where <laughs> are these museums Dang. getting money? They're not getting tickets. They're not getting school events. You can't just, I mean, it's, it's again, it's wonderful that people are, are, are making music, but musicians deserve to get paid. And museums have to make money. And, and I think that it's just really important. And, you know, it's great that people in Italy are, are singing opera. But you know something that Italy is doing that the United States is not doing? Italy has set aside $220 million to support artists during the pandemic. The United States, the CARE Act, I think what they gave um, artists was $75 million. That's an embarrassingly small fraction. Okay. How are we going to support our arts without support? Yeah. We can't. Well, in Georgia, I think uh, organizations are used to private philanthropy as the as the main source of funding. Other states do offer a lot of state tax support. New York, New York, uh, California, um, Massachusetts, um, Georgia arts organizations. Oh, look, the chat is suddenly uh, is popping up. Arts need support. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we know our audience well. I think we have people who are very invested in the arts. Um, so I want to just, uh, you know, we're going to wrap up. And I, I feel like this conversation has just get it, gotten started. Um, Laura Smith points out all that money uh, went to previously NEA funded organizations. So that's CARES Act. That's right. You already that's had a very to good point. Yeah federal support. So new artists that weren't necessarily getting or, or individual organizations. This is a wonderful conversation. I wish we could keep going. And again, we will invite you all back for future um, on stage and we can be together. And uh, again, the three of us are creative people. We work in a creative industry. So I want to ask you, um, how will your work, you answered Jamila's question about young reporters sort of entering the field at this time, um, but how has the media industry as, as a whole, I guess we should really just keep it to public radio. What trends are you seeing and how your work may change going forward? 
Well, I, I, I can speak to things that are happening at, at NPR. Um, you know, it's 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 a rough time for us. Um, our our listenership has 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 plummeted partly because people aren't in their cars driving to work. Um, we've always depended on a huge segment of our audience for that. Um, you may have noticed that a lot of our podcasts are going daily, um, which is is one thing that we're doing partly out of a belief in the content and also because it's a really good way to, to interest advertisers. Um, and, um, and I think that you're, that NPR, and, and I, I love Yuki's sense of this too, um, uh, yeah, NPR is going to continue to, to do the very, very strong work it does. NPR could not do the work it does without help from the member stations. And I, um, and, uh, I, I, and I worry a lot, particularly about our, our, our smaller member stations, which don't have the the name the brand recognition that we the NPR does that has a, a harder time finding advertisers and support, but are still managing to do unbelievably innovative and creative um, podcasts and new ways to 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 serve their listeners all the time. We're doing more online stuff. We're doing more pod, you know, I said podcasts already, but you're you're going to see NPR continuing to try to adapt and change. Yeah, I mean, I. Um... I think that we have spent so much more time on, like it's been a very re, uh, resource intensive period uh, for us in in a lot of ways and trying to put out podcasts or like, you know, all things considered did sort of, you know, um, a daily episode that, you know, just, just to keep up with all the things that were going on with the pandemic. And I, I agree with, with Netta, I, I I think that in terms of journalism, you know, you've seen even before the pandemic a massive collapse in local newspapers, uh, local media, and you know now I think about this in the context of you know local stations. People need local news. You know, the um, the pandemic is global, but the circumstances are local, and those are very important. And I do, I do feel like the lack of sort of local news support is very concerning for our democracy. And in the midst of a pandemic, that's especially true. Um, you know, like I said, I think individually, I feel a huge sense of purpose. And, you know, not that I didn't before, but, you know, but if, you know, a, a huge sense of purpose around news gathering. And I'm very concerned for all the reasons that are affecting the arts in general and NPR uh, about sort of the kinds of investments that we could and should be making now um, to make sure that that continues and that we still have those things. So, um, you know, I, I think that, um, like I said before, I think we're gonna be all working from home and being independent um, and that's going to be sort of a challenge organizationally for, I think, a lot of organizations, not just NPR, but, um, but I do, I do worry about the financial future of it. I think, you know, what, what the pandemic has done is accelerate some of the trends that, uh, NPR will have to adapt and local stations will have to adapt quickly. And, and, uh, I hope we do figure that out. Well, likewise, well, I will, I will end, uh, for both of you thanking you. Our CEO, Taya Ryan, says thank you both for a wonderful conversation. We love having both of you on air, and I will agree with Taya. And I'd like to thank uh, all of our, um, everybody who joined us this evening. Our next conversation in our NPR virtual speaker series will take place Thursday, November 12th. I hope you will join us for that conversation with GPB's Virginia Prescott. Tamara Keith and Sarah McCammon of NPR as they discuss where things stand one week after the election. You can find more online at gpb.org slash community. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you to our panelists and cheers uh, remotely. Uh, I look forward to doing this sometime in person uh, when it's safe again. So all of you, please stay safe, be healthy and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much.